so <laughs> let's let's go forward a little bit now because from a young age you moved to new york city right yeah yeah what was that first experience like when you first got there like were you scared out of your mind? Like, they, obviously, they named you Bambi for a reason. You know what I mean? Did you, I were mean, you scared for real? I, I sort of, I traveled a lot already by then. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I mean, yeah, that was 10 years ago. So I was already traveling for a couple of years before that. Mm -hmm. um, like, during high school, I was kind of, like, going to uh, Paris and Milan, um, London. And I actually went to New York a couple of times already before. But that was more for, like just like a, a couple weeks or like a weekend or for a gig or something like that. Right. Um, but I don't, I didn't remember being scared really. I, I remember being like inspired mm. and I remember the first time I landed in New York and driving down like the East side river from the airport. And I was like, I need to live here. Like this is so incredible. Yeah. And actually in school we had to do this thing where we had to plan like, I think this is grade six or something like that. Mm -hmm we had to plan what we wanted for our future. And I was like, I want to buy a house in New York already. I was thinking like, that, that's what I want. Yeah. I even looked it up and I, I it was like Googling it. And I remember reading this article about Harlem and how it was like cleaning up and it was going to be like the next best place to live. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I should buy it like now. And then by the time like I sell it, it's going to be, you know, worth so much more like i was already thinking that, that way at yeah. like a really young age so i i don't i never was really like a scared type of person i'm like i definitely keep to myself mm -hmm. when i'm alone traveling but um yeah i don't know it, new york's not like it, it's not as dangerous as people talk about you know unless you're going to like some place in the bronx that you know yeah. but mostly Manhattan and, and most places in Brooklyn are totally like, you know, almost Toronto now. <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot of people don't realize that though. Right. Um, yeah. And you started moving around, like you started doing a residency at, um, and let me make sure I get the name of this place right here. Um, Hakkasan. Hakkasan. Yeah. Right. That's where you met Calvin, Calvin, um, Calvin Harris. Harris. Right. Yeah. How did you get the residency over there first? before that meeting well, came to be? I, start, I mean, I started my DJ career in New York, so mm -hmm. I was started playing more and more gigs there. And that's actually when I stopped modeling because I was getting so busy just doing gigs. And I started making money like cash. Um, and I mean, don't tell the tax people, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, and I got a residency in Atlantic City, which um, the owners of that were opening uh, um, Hakkasan. Mm. So they kind of saw how I... I kept bringing people back. So every time I DJed, people would want to come. Yeah. Um, so they're like, hey, do you want a residency in Vegas? Because, I mean, they paid me way less than every other DJ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the same people were coming. So it was like, I mean, it's, it was kind of a no-brainer for them. Like, we can make money on the days that she performs and people right. like her. So, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I started, I was really lucky, though, to get that because... Um, most of the people that they brought in for Hakkasan were mainly like European, um, big, big EDM DJs. Okay. Who were making like hundreds of thousands a gig. So like a lot of money. So yeah. I was kind of like, okay, I guess like I'll, I'll come in there. And I, I actually had a lot of DJs kind of mad and jealous and stuff. And a, a few of them like messaged me and were like, how did you get this residency? Like, it's not fair. And mm. And like, if people want to see you, like that, that's what being an artist is. So yeah, yeah. it doesn't, if it's faster or slower, it's not, you know, it's always different depending on, you know, the situation. So I never like, I, I get why you would feel like that if you've been working so hard to try to get something and then somebody else gets it that just kind of shows up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how some people saw me as like kind of just showing up out of nowhere. But yeah. um I mean, I don't think they saw how much I worked for that, but their perspective. Everybody thinks that everyone just shows up out of nowhere and like, you know, but it's it's hard work. And every anybody that gets anywhere has been struggling for it. Yeah, I you, you got to work behind the scenes to get into the spotlight. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you got the residency over there at, at Hackerside and you're, you're, you're doing your thing. And yeah. then you meet up with Calvin Harris and you... Sent, you know, you give them your music. 
right? Yeah, so he actually he messaged me on Twitter and he was like like I don't know who you are. Like I know all the other DJs. Like how did basically how did you get here? Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Well, I'm playing like a little bit around the US and in New York." Um and he was just like, "Do you do you have music?" Cuz he's like, "This is <laughs> crazy, you know? Like this girls just like showing up out of nowhere." So yeah. He wanted to know more, so um, yeah, I sent him a couple of songs, and one of them he signed to his label. Yeah, I was like, "What? Really?" <laughs> so break that down to me, because in hip hop, we don't usually sign to labels per song, but yeah. in the in the electronic music world, that happens. Like you're signed, you know, for one record, and then you can go on to another record and sign to somebody else, because you've been signed to multiple labels like you've been signed to like five different labels i've seen but you're not signed Um, to them i think at at the time this is like i don't know seven years ago or something Mm -hmm. eight i don't don't know exactly but um at the time that was happening a lot more but then the like spinning records is one of the biggest indie dance labels so they ended up being like no we're not going to sign singles anymore unless you commit to us so that's like kind of changed and now like a lot of dj producers are making their own labels and Mm. um that sort of thing but someone like spinning they have such a huge platform that like you you put a song on there and then like everybody all these dance music fans are going to see you so it's kind of like you you give them all your royalties but at the same time you're like you know the idea is that you get more gigs Mm -hmm. and and so you don't make the money off the music but but you get more gigs and fans and stuff like that interesting See, yeah i never knew that that's how it worked with them um, with with y'all scene like that's really like a double-edged sword because like you, you're looking at how much money that the single is selling when they put it on different compilations and stuff like that but you're still making some money in in another way you don't think yeah. hey, maybe sh- you know you should be getting a percentage of that though i think that in i mean in edm dj world um it's like the DJ producer is sort of, I think it has traditionally been more of like a bigger artist than like a hip hop producer or like a pop producer. Right. It's sort of like you're the DJ and then whoever the vocalist is, is like the feature or like the side thing. So that's kind of what it's been like for the last few years. Yeah. It's always been kind of weird to me, but the fact that most of the, those club songs are mainly instrumental and, um, you know, it's not m- as much of a top line than, it wouldn't make sense to, you know, have them as the main kind of artist. So instead of singing, you're basically just DJing and that's your way to perform your music. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, it, when I started doing more hip hop, I noticed like a lot, some people didn't really get why I would be like the artist on the song as well. So, because they're more used to just having, oh, this is my producer, you know. And sometimes you put, some some people are putting their name like Dom Diaz. I know he Metro has his name on some stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes. People are doing it now. Yeah. Murder beats and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not, it's not, it's not a normal thing. Yeah. It's yeah. I think like someone like a Murder Beats, like he started DJing now because he. I think that they're kind of taking the influence from the EDM kind of culture and being mm-hmm. like. You know why don't we do this too? Because the the fees for DJing are like uh, they were like really great for a long time. Right. Obviously now with COVID, it's kind of different story. Yeah, um, it kind of reached this like boom too because there's some DJs that were just making like ridiculous amounts of money. Um, yeah. But you answer your question, you do make money from those songs. So like my song Space Jungle, for example. <laughs> Huge. I own 100% of the writing and production royalties. Nice. So, yeah, because I didn't do it with anybody else. But when I signed to the label, they take like 80%. So, and then they have all their costs. And then mm. so you're, you're, you're making the royalty money from Spotify, mm-hmm. but um, you're not, the publishing side of it's a little bit harder to make that money from. And the, um, yeah, it's a little dry, but. <laughs> no, no, no. This is like, I don't know. My audience sometimes, some of them might be, but to me, as the industry in this insider guy, this is like mm-hmm. important information. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. 
while the people who watch our platform, a lot of them are artists, they need to know this type of stuff as they go and, you know, they navigate through the industry. Right. right? They need to know what to look out for. Right. I actually noticed and I was surprised how many like because now I'm working with so many more artists like and some smaller hip hop artists as well because mm -hmm. um, I've worked with like big artists as well like Ludacris and stuff like that and, yeah, little John. and I've done yeah I've done remixes for you know Def Jam and like more corporate like major label stuff mm -hmm. so I, I was kind of used to it being a certain way and then when I started working with artists that don't have that experience yet and then I have to like explain it to them like certain things how it works yeah. it, it, it's confusing and it took me a while to understand it but it can be a little frustrating for me sometimes because i'm like you know th they're coming from it a more like indie way and now i am too because i started my own label mm -hmm. so i have to kind of like find that balance of like you know how my how much time do i spend like explaining something to somebody but i think it shows like it is good important for people to do the research because yeah some people like there's been rappers that just like take beats like you send them something and they just take it and use it and you're like it's you not how it works like, <laughs> you never yeah. you never asked my permission to use that i might I'm, you might have sold that to somebody else already yeah exactly yeah. I, I don't think some people realize also how much time it takes to actually produce a song sometimes i mean yeah. depending on the song but like I've also written top lines before and sometimes I spend a day and I go write a song mm -hmm. and but producing a record will be like, you know, months or, you know, weeks, hours. It, the time consumption is so, you know, so much compared to writing a top line. Yeah. So I think sometimes people are just like I've had a few guys like like they send me a vocal or something and they're like, hey, do you have something already? Like a few hours later. And I'm like, dude, like. <laughs> Give me, give me uh, some time. Yeah, and, and explain for me even what's the top line. Oh, sorry, a top line is a is the vocal basically. Mm. It's like the it can be a sing, singing or it could be a rap or whatever right. the vocal part of it. Yeah. So you're just talking about like the whole written sixteen or the vocal that might be on there, or you're just talking yeah. about like a ghost uh, idea, like uh, maybe just like the mumble of the flow of what it might be. I mean, that would be like the demo of the top line, I guess. So like with Bop, for example, like Dylan and Chris wrote the top line. We don't throw no shade, pull up with them sticks. Ooh, yeah. I don't know a nigga like me. Well, no nigga. Because they're doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know if you would call like technically like rap top line, maybe not. But that's just what I call it. Because uh, I'm used to like singers and stuff too. Okay. I don't think it, that, you know what I mean. <laughs> 